good afternoon or good morning or even good evening depending on how you're watching this um, so in this session I am going to demonstrate some of the benefits of using Adobe Bridge as a file browser. What's great about Bridge I believe is that it's a very simple way to access all your image files and documents and this could include video also and to be able to do this in a very intuitive and uh, visual way. Bridge should be installed on all the school machines and many of you that are using Photoshop should have this as part of your subscription. So here goes. This is the interface and the first thing that I want to show you is that over here on the left you have a folders tab and a favorites tab. So your favorites would kind of represent some of the stuff that you choose to have in there, a bit like Finder. In our folders we can see here on the preview here that we have my external hard drive and Macintosh hard drive. So if I click on the arrow next to where it says computer, we can see these are reflected here. And if I click on the arrow next to my external hard drive, we can see in here that I have a whole bunch of folders and all of these contain mainly images. And if I scroll down and just find one or two of these. Let's have a quick look. Probably a good one is this one. So I can then put my subfolders within here and then within those there are subfolders again. If I quickly find the folder that I want to, to demonstrate with images for collage here. You can see if I click on this then the images are displayed as thumbnails. These can be increased in size and I can also view these with key information underneath. Key information to the right and as a list. And if I click on one of these, in this Essentials view, we can see that we have a preview image here. And over here we have key information, which is metadata. And I'm going to describe exactly what this is shortly. But this key information here gives you information about the image as it was shot. Aperture and shutter speed and ISO. Um, pixel dimensions, size in megabytes and color space and all of this is entirely customizable to your preference so you can literally drag and if I want to I can save the workspace so it's really really flexible and there's so much going on here I'm not going to drill into too much with regards to the interface because it's it's very intuitive I prefer to use the film strip display and again I can decide on the size of my thumbnails there I can decide on the information displayed below and I can change all of those settings under here to change the view slightly should I wish <clears throat> but importantly as I scroll through the images I can see a large scale preview. So it's quite easy to, once you've, say for example, shot a number of images, you can scroll through them and see which ones are working well for you. You can also, if you click on a part of the image, it brings up um, what's called a loop, and you can see some of the detail of the area that you want to make sure that's in focus. Click on that again to remove it. Okay, so 
what's really great for me about this is about workflow. It's about kind of moving through your images very quickly and being able to select the ones you want to use and then to be able to do some automated tasks such as battery naming and also applying key metadata. Okay, so just before we drill into all this, you can see at the top here there are various different tabs such as libraries. Yeah, I don't actually use these, but some people find these useful, um, particularly when you're tapping into um, uh, library mode and even to find public libraries which would have uh, stock images both free and paid for. As I said, film strips, microfab choice. Output enables you to uh, lay out your images and change paper sizes, etc. Uh, that might be particularly useful for some of uh, you guys. Metadata. This shows key information that's attached to your image. There's different ways of viewing this. And you can see on the left-hand side here, there's fields for lots of really important information. And all this information sits either as a sidecar file, which is a, a file of data, which sits next to your image, or is embedded um, within the image, but it's invisible unless you view it in uh, something like Adobe Brief. And then finally, keywords. And I haven't done much there, but basically, if you in within the metadata add keywords to images, then you can use that as a way of filtering. Let's keep it simple. Okay. So if you want to, uh, for example, create a new folder, you click on here to create a new folder. And if you want to delete a folder or images, you select what you want to delete and hit the waste button. Okay. So what I really like about Bridge is that if we have a little look here, going through the images, it has a really usable rating system. So if there's an image I like, I can scroll through. Okay, so this is an image I want to choose. So um, if I go to label, we can see here that we have options for command one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine to add a star rating or a label. So if I command five, I will give this a five star rating. And then if I just scroll through, like that one too, and quickly just scroll through, okay, like that one. Like that one. And I like that one, I think. Okay, so I've selected a bunch here with five star ratings. Now what's really good is if I go up to um, view and sort, I can decide I can have them in a particular order. Currently they're in file name, but if I put them in rating here, it will send all of the rated images to one end of my browser. And if we go up here, we can see there's another option for doing that. So if I go to file name, it will take them back to how they were. So there are lots of options there for um, sorting by file name type, etc., size, color profile, lots of options. Or you can even do it manually. And you can, you can sort manually just by simply dragging around because that overrides everything. But what I want to do, I think, is then to select now again by rating. Okay. 
I could also, as I mentioned earlier, um, earlier um, if I shift and click to select all of those, if I really like them or want to again kind of uh, approve them further, maybe I've worked on them slightly, then I could, for example, I like to use Command 8, which is green label. You can work out exactly what works best for you. Okay, so there are another couple of things that um, I think it's really worth pointing out. And if we notice with all the images here, they currently are given the naming convention that comes out of the camera. And you can see there's a suffix, which in this case is CR2. This refers to Canon RAW 2. Okay, which is basically uh, Canon's native RAW format. And this means that if I try and open this file, it's going to open uh, directly within Adobe Camera Raw, which we will come to uh, later on. And below this, there's a bunch of key information, which you can decide on what you want to show or not. So let me show you a couple of things. If I go up to Bridge and Preferences, one of the things that I'm able to do, and there's lots of stuff you can really play around with, but you know, um, there's, there's information out there and you can explore this, but I'm trying to simplify and also uh, help you see the value of it. So on the thumbnails tab, we can see here that we've got a details area and you can show they created and lots of information, dimensions, color profile, and size. And here we can see they created dimensions, color profile, and size. Okay, so this is a really useful thing to be able to see all that key information quite quickly, and particularly the dimensions and the size. Okay. Also, the browser um, enables images to be opened directly into Adobe Camera Raw. So with those selected, if I click on this, uh, it's an aperture icon it will open directly in Camera Raw, or simply double click. What's really useful is that you can open and edit um, processed images such as JPEGs and TIFFs and HEICs in Raw. But to do this directly from Bridge, you have to go up to Camera Raw Preferences, and in file handling here, you can set that you want to automatically open JPEGs and HEICs with settings and also TIFFs with settings. That means that it makes it really useful that you're able to then open process files from within here, bridge and edit them within the same Camera Raw dialog, which for me is a very straightforward, uh, easy way of editing images. It aligns very nicely with Lightroom, and to be fair, has similarities to Capture One Pro, which I think is the best of the raw imaging software out there. One useful thing that I think is, is really invaluable is if I stick with these images that are selected you can go to tools and you can give a batch rename 
and that means that quite quickly, and this could be thousands of images, quite literally, if I click on that, and we can see that we've got um, dialogue. Uh, this is my approach to doing it, so I'm going to give it a name. So I'm going to call this uh, Degree Show, and this is 20... 2019 because we didn't have one last year and hopefully we'll be having one this year so I've put underscores and I'm going to put an underscore there then you can select your sequence number so there's different options for what you want to add so I'm going to put a sequence number and in this case I'm going to select two digits but it could be up to six digits if I put a one in and then you've got options here to preserve current file name in XMP data. You can choose to use that if you want. Um, and compatibility with Windows and Unix is recommended. And we can see the, pre the preview. That's the current file name. And here we have the new file name. Okay, so click rename. And there we go, those images are all renamed accordingly. Right, there we go, they're all renamed. So re really useful for when you kind of uh, selected your images that you want to work on or you've worked on them and then you want to rename them at a filing convention that, that works best for you. I'm also going to select these three images and I'm going to give them a five star rating and I'm going to also give them an orange label and if I now go back to tools and battery name we can see here that the previous name that I've used exists and also um, the sequence number is set for the next number of the sequence so if I click rename, there we go, we've organised them all there, and if I go, I've done it automatically, but I could sort them by label, okay, or by rating, or by size if I wanted to and then you can see it split them up again but let's go back to rating because I like them all in one place so you can start to see the versatility of this as a file management software then we're going to get really clever with it and this is um, something that I think is really important to understand and let's have a look at this. So I mentioned metadata, so I'm going to select all these images, or at least the ones that I like. And I could do all of them to be honest with you. I probably should, but let's keep it simple. If I go to tools and create metadata template. So I'm going to now create a new template. I'm going to give it a name and I'm going to call it uh, Degree Show. And below this, there is a kind of bunch of fields that I can add. And this includes Creator. In this case, that was me. I'm a photographer. Need to remember how to spell that. And I could put my address. I could put my phone number. Email. And website. And then there's much more information. So headline.
and you can add keywords. So keywords are really useful to be able to kind of source your images and actually for your images to be found in search engines should you put them on a website and or should you have them in the image stock library. Okay, so I'm just going to say um, WSA Winchester School Art University of Southampton. All the stuff that would apply to these uh, degree show. And you can carry on. The more information you can get there, the obviously the better. And then you can add um, various key information, IPTC subject code. So that stands for International Press and Te Telecommunications Council, which is a body that uh, refers to the protection of images or management of images through uh, this data, which is metadata. We don't have one of those. Oops, I went a bit wrong. But you can add lots of information with regards to what you want to sit alongside the image or images. So importantly here, we have copyright notice. If you created an image, made an image, and you have ownership of it by doing so, then you could add copyright. So uh, option G will give the copyright symbol I did 2021 but I should have probably done 2019 at the time and then I can choose whether I want to have it identified as copyrighted or public domain or unknown I'm going to go copyrighted because you know you can add here all rights reserved or if you're doing it the work for a client um, you can add rights usage as per license all of this gets a little bit confusing as to how you license your images and uh, etc but the important thing for you as students I think to start off with is just to get used to your rights reserved that would do it for now so this sits with the image okay and I'll explain exactly how you can view that so there's other really important information here that you can kind of add if you've got if you use a model, you could have information about the model there. Um, camera EXIF data is something that can be applied. So that's, um, we can have a look at that in a second. That will have the important information of how the image was, was made. So lots of stuff to explore. But the key stuff really is to add your details and as much as possible to the image and make sure that this exists. Now, with a raw image, you've got the raw file. So that also serves as digital negative. That's your evidence of having your image. But if you now convert these to a usable file formats such as JPEG or TIFF, etc., this information will be embedded. That's the important thing. It stays with the image. I'm going to save that. Okay, so now if I go to Tools, and you can see where I click on Edit Metadata Template, we have Degree Show added. I've got a few of these here going on. Whilst I've created the template, I now need to add it to these selected images or any selected images. So if I go to Append Metadata with the images selected here, and degree show then if I control click and go to file info this brings up a separate panel 
and it gives all the information that I described, including my website, uh, keywords, headline, and finally down here, the important stuff, copyright. Okay. If you click up there, we can see the camera data. And there's lots of other information that you can add, add to this, um, including Photoshop history um, and even raw data. So raw data is all that lovely code that exists within this image. So it's loads of data. And for those of you that love a bit of data, there's lots of stuff to find within this. That's essentially... Um, I think the important stuff. So what I am just going to show you quickly is if I now uh, double click, not on these two, I'm going to double click on this one here because I want to bring your attention to these controls here. These basically mean that the, image, the images have been opened and edited slightly within Adobe Camera Raw. Oops, it's jumping around. So if I double click on an image that hasn't been affected, and this opens quite nicely within the camera raw dialog. If I now just make a very slight change, I'm just going to use the exposure slider to take the exposure down and maybe take the highlights down just quickly. Okay, and then if I click done at the bottom here then we can see that if I click on the image there, we now have the sliders in the top right corner, which indicates that the image has been worked on with Adobe Camera Raw. The other thing I'm going to do is just use a different image. Double click on this. And I will be doing another session to go into the detail of Adobe Camera Raw. But what I'd like to do is just quickly to, um, let's just work on it slightly so we can see some difference, take the highlights down, maybe pull up the saturation. And I'm now gonna click at the top here Convert and save image. So if I click on this, it brings up another dialog and it gives me lots of options, including location. So I can choose to save in the same or a new location. Often it's a good idea to save in a new location because you will be saving out as a different file format. If you want to, you can change the document name. So if you want to just change it slightly to demonstrate something, there's no point in this because I've already changed the name and the suffix will change automatically. I want to save it as a JPEG. There's a file extension. I've got a choice here between a DNG, dig digital negative, which is Adobe's, uh, if you like, native um, raw image format. I personally don't use that very often. JPEG, TIFF, Photoshop, or PNG. Okay. In this case, I want a JPEG. I keep all the metadata, because I love metadata. And the quality, I want to be maximum. And you can also, if you need to, limit the file size. So if you're kind of preparing an image that you want to use for website or digital portfolio, you can limit the file size here to a certain size, or a maximum size, which is really useful. Color space, quite important. Uh, don't know why, but for some reason it's set as sRGB. Uh, I tend not to use that very often, and I like to use the Adobe RGB color space all the time. And you can also change the bit depth. So if you're thinking about printing at really high quality and large scale, you can increase that to 16 bits. I think only if that's a 
TIFF. There you go. JPEGs only work in 8-bit. And then you've got image sizing. So I'm not going to resize to fit, but if I wanted to, I could resize this to make sure that the long side or the short side or the dimensions, etc., are a certain size. So if I if I choose to have this long size as long side as 1600 pixels and a resolution of 150, I know full well that I'm going to reduce the image size significantly, probably great for a digital portfolio. Yeah, I can reduce that even more. But in my case, what I want to do here is keep it 300 ppi and don't resize the fit. So I want to keep those pixel dimensions that exist. And then you can also, depending on your output, you can include sharpening for screen, glossy paper, or matte paper. Again, I tend not to have this on unless I know it's going to be displayed predominantly on a screen. So let's save that. And if it's done and I click done, we can see now we've got a JPEG version there of that one. Okay. Now, where is it? So I can now open this JPEG in, in Camera Raw. So let's have a look. If I try and double click on it to open it, it's going to open within Photoshop. I don't want that because I want to work in Adobe Camera Raw. So what you do, you control click and open with Camera Raw. And once it's opened, you can use exactly the same controls as you would have done previously when working with a raw image. Now, what I will say is working with JPEGs and TIFFs or pixel-based images, there's going to be a bit of give and take about what you can do and you can't do it and the quality and the after, sorry, the um, artifact that you might apply to an image particularly if it's a JPEG image of fairly low quality. So it's really useful to know because this tool is brilliant, not only as a tool on its own, but as a way in for Lightroom. And this is great if you want to very simply um, work on an image, just get it right, uh, without any manipulation or anything, you're just basically working on the exposure, the color, uh, and detail. Okay, so I'm going to click done there. And at this point, I'm going to stop with this session, which is part one, and I will record a second session, which is uh, exclusively for Adobe Camera Raw. Thank you.